Um, we have a really great speaker in Brett Seymour. Uh, Brett is a, a postdoctoral fellow in the Living Earth Collaborative at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, he studies the effects of both natural and artificial lighting on insects and uh, avian predators. Uh, before he come, came to Washington University, Brett was a postdoc, postdoctoral fellow at the National Park Service uh, Night Skies Division, studying the effects of artificial light on various organisms. He's trained in phys visual physiology and behavioral ecology at Arizona State University and at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. His presentation tonight is titled Dark Sides of Light. Um, we're going to go for about 40, 45 minutes. We'll have time at the end for questions. I think it'd be best to hold your questions till the end. We'll have 10 or 15 minutes. Try to get things wrapped up 8.15 at the latest if we can. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Brett Seymour. Brett, that was a large applause going on in the background. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I haven't done anything yet. That was for your wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you, Dennis, and thank you all for having me. Um, thank you for letting me kind of the word I want to use here. Pose as an avian and uh, biologist and ornithologist tonight. I, I would say that the, for the last several years of my career, I've been more of an entomologist. But I do, I do have a, a warm spot for birds, especially because birds are so important in the lives of insects. And you know, putting this talk together, I realized I have done quite a bit of work on birds. Uh, I just usually don't sell it as a bird research. I sell it as um, insect work with birds. So. Uh, yeah, 40 minutes. We're going to try to cover a lot of ground. We're going to, I hope that this is more going to be uh, focused on uh, breath over depth, but uh, I hope, yeah, I hope it's enough and we, you know, we can handle questions at the end and, and dig deeper. So with that in mind, uh, here's a quick little outline. Let's see, is this going to work? Okay, yeah, oh, before we outline, and really quick, just want to uh, mention a few entities. So yes, I'm with uh, Washington University, the Living Earth Collaborative, which is formed from the Washington University Biology Department, uh, the, the zoo, and the Missouri Botanical Garden. But I also have a home at uh, St. Louis University and also the National Great Rivers Research uh, and Educate National Great Rivers Research and Education Center uh, up in um, Alton, Illinois. And a lot of the work today, though, is actually coming from previous studies I did when I was at the National Park Service and Colorado State University in the front range of Colorado. Uh, and two quick little shout outs. Uh, one is, you know, I've already seen some questions in the chat about more information about uh, lighting and light pollution and, and local grants and programs that can be done at a local level to curb light pollution. The best place for that is darkskymissouri.org. So this is part of the International Dark Sky Association. I'm a committee member on that. Um, Don Ficken is, is the leader of that currently. I believe he's actually joined on this talk. Uh, so feel free to reach out to, to both of us, either of us, if you have more specific questions, definitely check out the website. We're always looking for new members. So if this is something that uh, you're interested in, please drop us a line. I should also mention that um, Dark Sky Missouri is involved in the Lights Out Heartland program, trying to get a lot of these buildings to turn off lights during the migration of birds. And then one more entity that I'd like to just put a little plug in for is the Zoological Lighting Institute. This is a nonprofit who's focused on working with zoos and aquaria to um, have better lighting practices for animal welfare. All right, with all that being said, tonight's talk. So we're first gonna talk about light pollution, then we're gonna uh, transition to just global light pollution in general. Um, and then we'll get into the bird stuff, right? I was told a bird talk, so this will be a bird talk. So we're gonna get into reception and detection of light pollution by humans and birds. Um, and then we'll switch to a nice little study that we, we ran to look at how different colors of light affect avian behavior and physiology. And then, uh, and all that stuff is published. And then this last thing I'm ending with is something I'm currently writing up. And this is how different urban lights affect the predation, the ability of birds to detect moths uh, at night. So let's get to it. All right, so let's just really quickly introduce uh, light pollution. National Geographic Lost in Light film is a fantastic way to do that. 
So in this video, I don't know if you can hear the sound, Doesn't you don't need to hear the sound, but um, that's part of the video. So what you'll see in this video is you see you know, these, this glow and also all these direct light sources. You can see the, the planes, you can see cars. Uh, if we start again over here, again, you have all these direct light bulbs. If you can see my mouse there and here. Um, so you basically have two different uh, light sources, or I should say two different types of light that contribute to light pollution. You have these direct sources, which gas flares, street lights, headlights, um, most of what you think of when you think of light pollution, but even a bigger contributor to the overall effects of light at night, or I should say the, the global altering of natural light regimes is due to uh, indirect sources or sky glow. And we'll dive into that a little bit more than a second, but just know that when you talk about light pollution, it's really, it's, there's two different uh, contributors, direct sources, which then lead to sky glow because all the light from these direct sources is scattered by the atmosphere. And you get these, these sky domes, as you can see here in the bottom left figure, this is uh, actually a photo that uh, one of my colleagues and I took on um, some mountains in the front range looking east and you can see Fort Collins on the, the right, that's the big sky glow there, and then also Cheyenne, Wyoming uh, on the left. And so, you know, you can't actually see the direct light source, you just see all of this, the scattering of light. All right, and of course, many of you are interested or have seen um, these, these light pollution maps that are very popular due to wonderful satellite imaging and photos from, um, NASA and astronauts uh, really showing how much light there is at night, right? Um, the Black Marble is a, a, a new program using satellite data that shows just how, how uh, pervasive light pollution really is across the globe. So 83% of the world population, this is 2016, it's more now because we know that light pollution is growing at about two to 3%, both in intensity and uh, spatial extent. So in 2016, 83% of the world population lived under light polluted skies. Uh, in the United States and Europe, that was about 99% live under light polluted skies. So it's, it's something that affects most of us. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so I really just wanna drive home this whole point of direct sources. So clearly here's a direct source out in a, what we would say is a more natural area. And you know that light is called, so luminance is the amount of light that's leaving a source going out forth in kind of a cone direction. And that's going up into the sky. It's also going out into the forest, going out onto the grass, it's going into wherever. And as it goes up into the sky, it interacts with all these aerosols and other uh, molecules and the fog, for instance, water molecules, all these molecules in the atmosphere and it's scattered and it creates this, this sky glow or this just basically this light fog. And I mean light as in uh, a light bulb fog, not uh, the opposite of heavy. So you have this light fog and that, that sky glow actually will illuminate areas away from the direct source. So if you, you know, kept walking down this street you'd actually have more light coming down, illuminating the ground due to just sky glow, even if there's no direct sources. So you have this issue of the natural light levels in an area are being masked by just sky glow in general, or at least that's what we wanted to, to test. Uh, and why does all this matter? Well, for 4 billion years, the earth has had natural light levels and organisms have evolved under these specific light levels. Uh, and they have a lot of behaviors and physiology that are completely determined by these light levels. Circadian rhythms, for example, uh, need light to entrain them, uh, reproduction, phenology, all these things are cued by these different light levels. And it, it's no surprise because the light varies so much on a 24 hour cycle especially if you are closer to the equator. As you get uh, you know, closer to the poles, then it's not so much that changes on 24 hours, but instead changes seasonally where you have complete darkness uh, during winter and com complete light at, uh, during the summer. Regardless, let's just say during the day, uh, down here in you know, temperate areas or in the tropics, on a clear day, you have about 
100,000 lux, which is a unit of the amount of light hitting a surface, and it is weighted to the visual system of humans. So it's not a great metric for um, other organisms, but it's kind of all that we really have right now due to uh, equipment issues. So anyway, uh, on a clear day, about 100,000. Cloudy day drops it down by an order of magnitude. Um, and then sunset, sunrise. So as the sun's going down, the horizon are coming up from the horizon. We're at about 1,000 uh, lux. So there's still so many orders of magnitude of light. And this is where it gets really interesting for uh, organisms, because this is where they really cue in. It's not so much whether clear or cloudy day, it really has to do with when that sun's going down past the horizon, um, what's the light level and what are the behaviors associated with it. So we have different types of twilight, which basically just ranges from when the, the sun is between zero and 18 degrees, uh, and it goes in six degree increments. So civil twilight, you see this huge drop, right? We're talking three orders of magnitude here, and then about another two, between civil twilight and nautical twilight. And then at the end of astronomical twilight, it's pretty much night. Uh, and so these are new moon conditions with starlight and air glow. Um, and then it gets a little bit darker again if you have cloudy conditions. Now this is a natural situation. So if you start to have artificial light, that changes everything. So here are already nine orders of magnitude that animals can cue into to tell them when it's light, when it's day, when other animals might be um, active, such as your predators or your prey. Then there's another whole set of light levels based on lunar phase. So the, the lunar cycle also ranges across four orders of magnitude, going from uh, a thousandth of a lux up to about one lux on really bright full moon nights with maybe snow on the ground. Okay, with all that being said, so there's a lot of natural light levels, nine orders of magnitude, right? We're talking a billion times different from a clear day to um, a cloudy new moon condition. We did a literature review when I was with the National Park Service <clears throat> looking at all the published studies showing effects of these lower light levels. So basically the end of civil twilight, so this, the sun is already under the or below the horizon by six degrees. Um, what, yeah, what, what do we know? How many studies have really looked at these light levels uh, and organismal responses? Well, there are a lot. So over 130 studies showed that 83 different species depend on light levels to cue behavior and physiology. And this is, there were about 15 different types of behaviors ranging from predator and prey interactions to reproduction to uh, population interactions to vocal behavior, vigilance, all these things. So the key, the, the point here is that a lot of animals cue into these specific changes in light levels, going from 0.1 lux, so the end of nautical twilight, maybe down to crescent moon. All of this is um, very important for guiding a lot of behaviors. For example, a lot of desert rodents won't, will not come out of their dens until it's new moon conditions, because they're very likely to get uh, predated upon by, by owls and other uh, nocturnal avian predators. So a lot of research showing that these light levels are very, very important. So that's why, going back to this, we really care about the amount of light that is artificially being thrown into the environment from sky glow. So one of my tasks with the National Park Service was trying to figure out how we go from um, the, again, I should say the luminance that satellites are recording to the on the ground illuminance that organisms are actually dealing with. Because in a national park, there's very little uh, direct light sources, but there's all the sky glow coming to them. How are those organisms that are supposedly protected from anthropogenic factors, uh, how, is it, how is their environment really being impacted by the sky glow? So to do this, we can use these, these very uh, high tech uh, CCD cameras that can take a full hemispherical image like this. So this is in the Colorado Rocky Mountains, just west of Denver. Uh, and you just get these incredible images. And then you can actually map out the different levels of light. So you can see the sky glow from down here, this, this one on the right, that's, um, sorry, zoom is getting in the way here. Um, anyway, so here you've got Denver, then over here you have Fort Collins and then Cheyenne. And then we can actually integrate this, all these data and get overall uh, lux levels 
right? So we can calculate the amount of light that's going up compared to the amount of light that's coming down. And we can map this relationship between the amount of light that's going up, which is the luminance here, and the light that's coming down onto the ground. And what's really remarkable is when you map all this out, the equation is simply basically two pi. And then you can do a bunch of proofs and show that through the trigonometry, it makes sense that it would be two pi. But so we have two pi, and this is over uh, 200, yes, 279 sites in the National Park Service. So what we did is we took this conversion and we applied it to the satellite data, uh, which has a resolution of about 700 meters squared globally. And so we can now calculate, all right, we know the light that's coming up to the satellite. Well, what's the light that's coming back down from sky glow and illuminating all these areas? So we did this and we wanted to present it, going back to this figure, we wanted to present it in a way that makes sense, not just for scientists, but also for policy, uh, what do I want to say, policy managers, land managers, stakeholders, and also just the public. Everyone can relate to, oh, you know, it's very bright on a full moon and then it's, it's very dark on a new moon. So we converted all this to light levels that are respective of these different lunar phases. Now this map here, what this is going to show when I click this animation, first it's just going to show you all the light pollution globally. And then there's going to be a bar that shows up on the bottom of this map down here. And it's going to be color coded based on the lunar cycle, starting with a new moon and then ending with a full moon. The full moon stuff to see because it's mostly just in, in urban areas and the resolution, since we're looking at global scale, is tough to really see those white lights. There's a lot there though. All right, so here we go. All right, so that's all the, the light pollution globally. It's about 24% of all terrestrial area. Uh, so now what you're seeing right there is this is a doubling of natural light. Now it's 10 times brighter than natural a uh, hundred times and then a thousand times with the white light, which is again, is really difficult to see in this, this map. All right. So 23% of terrestrial earth is always brighter than new moon conditions. Um, and yeah, about 5% is brighter than quarter moon. This really matters because 50% of night is new moon condition. Either it's the moon's in new moon phase or the moon is below the horizon. So Animals have 50% of their nights are new moon dark. And so much of this land no longer ever will have new moon conditions. So there's already a big factor uh, or big pressure on these organisms. So we, um, we took this map and we overlaid it with global protected areas and key biodiversity areas. Uh, there are about 400,000 global protected areas and there are about 80, 85 key biodiversity areas. The key biodiversity areas are focused on biodiversity hotspots or, I mean, there, you know, there's spots up in the Arctic as well, but this is focusing on endemic species. We wanted to know how much of these areas that are supposedly protected from anthropogenic factors actually are protected or is light uh, bleeding into them. And what we found is that 77% of the global protected areas were polluted. Now, luckily, only 10% of the area was polluted, and that's because a lot of these really big ones are far away from uh, urban areas. But still, 1.6% uh, of the area was at crescent moon or greater. So that's 10 times brighter than natural, and that's the size of Texas. Key biodiversity areas are also 50% uh, were also um, polluted. And 6% of the area, which was about the size of California. So these areas that we have deemed are very important for conservation. There's a lot of them that are still heavily polluted by light. And as I've shown from the literature review there, this, this, is, this, is, this is very, very, very concerning. Uh, and now for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna focus on uh, a couple case points or case studies showing that. Uh, but really quick, so we also did an overlay of biodiversity um, for mammals and birds and amphibians. So this is a map showing the different uh, biodiversity across mammals, amphibians, and birds uh, with the gray is very heavily light polluted areas. So you can see down here, Venezuela, which is one of the brightest places in the world due to gas flares. Uh, and then of course, China and a lot of Southeast Asia is highly light polluted and highly biodiverse. 
So then we looked, so looking at these, um, the biodiverse areas of birds, we found that 25% of threatened birds do not experience natural light cycles ever. Uh, this is important as we'll, we'll get to later. 93% uh, of amphibians are, are nocturnal and 37% of their ranges never experience natural light cycles. We know there are a lot of effects on amphibians. And then lastly for mammals, which again, a lot are nocturnal, about 65% are nocturnal um, and about 25% of these threatened mammals never experience natural light cycles. We know a lot of hunting by uh, mammalian predators is determined by light level. And so if it's bright, they probably will not be hunting such as like bobcats and mountain lions. They're, they're very nocturnal. So natural light conditions is very important for these um, apex predators. Okay, let's back up for a second. And I want to talk about like, well, what is light actually, right? We know that well, it's a type of pollution. We use it all the time. I have it shining on me right now. I'm seeing it on my computer. Well, it all comes down to it's part of the electromagnetic, radi uh, electromagnetic radiation. It's a spectrum. And what we call light is the visible part of this, this spectrum, with shorter wavelengths of light being the, the violet and the blue that we perceive, and the longer wavelengths of light being the red, green, and yellow in the middle. You remember this from um, Roy G. Biv, the rainbow. So those are all just different lengths of the of the the wavelength of light. This is really important because this is how we see color, and also how we need to pay attention to light pollution. It's not just uh, light pollution is all created equally. It's very different based on the light source, and the way that we actually perceive these different colors comes down to our retina, where we have three different color photoreceptors that are called um, cones. And so these cone cells, we have a blue cone cell, a red cone cell, and a green cone cell. And they pick up the different um, light coming from a source or reflecting off an object. They communicate with each other in the brain, and we figure out what color is being seen. Now, this, of course, that was a very, very uh, coarse description of how color vision works. Happy to talk about opponent processing, all these other things at another time. Uh, but just know that it all comes down to the stimulation between the three different colored cones, and that's how you perceive different colors. So here are the spectral sensitivities of these different cones of the human visual system. We have the blue here, again, as I said, around 400, 450. We have the green cones here, and then we have the red cones here. If you're red, green, colorblind, you still have both green and red cones, but this red cone is actually shifted towards green, or green is shifted towards red. The rods, some of you are saying, well, he's not talking about rods. Rods are for um, motion sensing and mostly dim light vision. They're not involved in color vision. So at night, um, really dim light levels, you'll be using your rods and not your color vision. <clears throat> but for the rest of this talk, I mostly want to focus on uh, the cones. So with that being said, knowing that we have these three cones and they perceive different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, this is important because, as you can see in this photo here, there are all these different color lights. So artificial lights do not, they're not all the same. There's a bunch of different colors and we can actually go out and we can measure the spectrum of these lights. So here's an LED that's got this blue pump here and then the rest of this kind of broadband and the longer wavelengths. You have high pressure sodiums, which were historically very common from like the seventies up until recently when LEDs are being, uh, are replacing them. And then you have these metal halides. There's also mercury vapors. Metal halides appear, appear white to us because they simulate the blue, they simulate the green, and they simulate the red. Um, even though, as you can see, they're not just completely straight across. They are pretty peaky. All of these are peaky, yet we still see them as relatively white, with the exception of high pressure sodium, because the dominant wavelengths of light are mostly in the orange and red. All right, so now that you know everything there is to know about human color vision, um, I need to tell you that that's only really important for humans and a few other uh, ape species. Most animals, which most of them have eyes, um, I, yeah, 99% of animals have eyes. Uh, even plants have a lot of photoreceptors. Uh, they don't have any color vision similar to what humans have. So birds, for instance, have four different cones. They have much better color vision than us. You'll see that the green and the yellow are actually further spaced apart. And they also have an ultraviolet, depending on the species. Some species may just have a violet. 
But this is really important because what we're seeing at night with all these colors is not what most organisms are seeing. And that's, that's very, very important uh, to, to recognize. So one of my first projects with the National Park Service was actually due to a conversation I had with several engineers at a conference about how they said, like, doesn't matter what animal you're interested in, everything's going to be correlated. Uh, so it doesn't matter. Like, you can just use a human visual system or just look at it with your human eyes. And of course, I'm a visual ecologist. I was, I was offended by this statement. So I <laughs> wrote a paper and published it uh, showing that, in fact, this is not the case. We developed um, a tool using a 3D printer where we could actually measure specific light bulbs 25 meters apart and get this spectra here. So these are all the spectra of these different light sources in Fort Collins, Colorado. And then we can actually use uh, known visual models to see how animals or humans will perceive these lights. So the way we do that, let's go back to our human uh, visual model here, right? So she's looking at this light bulb, it's hitting her retina, which has those cones, and these cones have their different sensitivities. And the way it works is you can look at how this light, so this mercury vapor, which is the black light here, how it overlaps with the red cone, the green cone, and the blue cone, which basically each peak is going to be stimulating those cones. You can then map it onto what's called color space. The way you do that is you look at how much light each cone is going to be collecting. Think of it kind of like gumballs dropping into specific color boxes. So all the red gumballs will go into the red cone, green and the green and blue and the blue. And each light source has a different amount of gumballs based on the color. And then we can map that onto this triangle where each apex of the triangle represents green, blue, and red. So if you had a, a blue light, completely blue light, it would be here. And we would say humans would perceive this as completely blue because it's only simulating the blue photoreceptor. Uh, if it's green, it'd be down there green. If it's red, there. Now here's a question. Where would purple be? Remember that purple simulates both the blue and the red photoreceptor. So it'd be in the middle here. And that's confusing. Maybe this one will be a little bit easier. Think of black, gray, and white. So these don't technically have any color. And that's because they're just a flat spectrum. They stimulate all photoreceptors equally. So they are in the middle. So black would be there, gray would be there, and white would be there. All right, so now where would mercury vapor be? Well, mercury vapor you know, stimulates more of the, the green and the red than the blue. So it's down here. And of course you see there's a lot of red, so it's closer to the red. So we can do this. We can do this for, for anything that we know what the spectral sensitivity of the eye is. And when we do all of these, we see that yes, high pressure sodium maps it's be perceived very red by the human visual system. And then the metal halide, mercury vapor, sunlight, um, LEDs. These are closer to looking white, but they're still a little bit uh, on the reddish green side. Okay, but what about these birds I was talking about that have four different color cones and much better color vision? So we look at the starling. Now we get into what's called, that was triangular space or trichromatic. Now we have what's called tetrachromatic. And because they have these four cones, starling has ultraviolet vision. So we have this cool tetrahedron color space where you've still got the triangle down here. So the L, M, and S, basically think of that as the red, the green, and the blue. And then up top is the um, ultraviolet. So this is now a pyramid. So it's a four-dimensional, or it's a three-dimensional space. Uh, and again, in the middle of that pyramid would be white, gray, and black. So we can look at how this organism would perceive these different lights. Now, I'm giving you a two-dimensional representation here, which is really robbing you. If I had more time, I could actually show you a video of how it turns and you can see where these different, um, different lights are, but we don't have time. I also wanna show you another animal, another bird um, that's very nocturnal, the lesser nighthawk. We know the spectral sensitivity of this, which doesn't have the UV, it just has another um, very short wavelength or violet. Uh, wavelength receptive cone. And so again, the violet goes up on top. All right, so I've gone through all of that because what I wanna show is when you know this, you can actually use just noticeable differences, which is throwing noise into the visual system. You can actually calculate how, how different two light sources are, or two colors um, are to a visual system. 
And a just noticeable difference of one means that physiologically, there's no way that perceiver would see this as different. So if we look here, the just noticeable difference for a human equals 1.8, and that's a comparison between this metal halide and an LED, meaning that it's actually very difficult for our eyes to perceive these as different. We probably would see them as different, um, because it's really between about a one and a four where we're able to see anything under one, there's no way we're going to be able to see that like mercury vapor and LED. If I was just giving you the light of an LED or mercury vapor, you would not be able to tell them is different because our J and D is less than one. Now look at this. So we're looking at all these lights, right? And they're we're like, yeah, they're basically the same light. They're basically whitish, maybe a little reddish white. Birds on the other hand, have insanely high JNDs, meaning that they're seeing very different colors. So they're seeing a much more colorful night uh, than we are. And so for a human to say like, oh, you know, yeah, it's just a bunch of like white lights out there. That's not the case. We don't actually know what the birds are seeing. Like we don't know what color they can see because we don't, we don't have the same visual system. We can never know that. But what we do know is it's very different and it's dangerous to use uh, a human visual system to say how an, a bird is gonna be perceiving it. All right. However, it gets more complicated. It's just, it's not just vision that matters uh, for light pollution. We also have these photoreceptors that aren't used for vision, that are used for guiding so much of our physiology and our behavior, such as when we get hungry, our appetite, uh, tumor suppression, when we court, when we reproduce, when we can't sleep. All these things are based on non-visual photoreceptors which are called IPRGCs for intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglia cells. These are also in the eyes of mammals or in the brains of, of birds. And these detect light uh, that then lead to all these different systems and tell them when to turn on, when to turn off, when to secrete different uh, chemicals such as melatonin. And they also have their own spectral sensitivities. So here are the four main um, non-visual photoreceptors that we have in uh, vertebrates, neuropsin, melanopsin, pinopsin, and vertebrate ancient. Yes, melanopsin is what determines when your body will turn on and turn off melatonin. That's why melatonin, you can buy it and put you to sleep. Well, if you weren't looking at a blue, night, blue light at night, you wouldn't need to go buy melatonin because your melanopsin wouldn't be collecting light and your body would be producing melatonin naturally. So this is also what happens in birds. Um, and so we also modeled this, just showing that most of these lights, so these are different lights again, high pressure sodium, the LED, the metal halide, and the mercury vapor, and how they stimulate these different um, deep brain photoreceptors. And the point is here, is that they're highly stimulating these. So these poor birds, uh, or poor turtles, or poor humans out there at night are getting a lot of stimulation from these photoreceptors that guide their behavior uh, in physiology. And this is a problem. But again, these are just models. So we actually need to run experiments to see what the, the actual effects are. All right, and we're probably gonna have to cut a little bit short on the last part, but we'll see how we do. So I teamed up with Valentina Alassam. Um, she's a, she at the time was a PhD student at University of Nevada, Reno. And we did this study looking at dim light of different colors. So these are both LEDs. We had a blue LED, which is this 5000 K. This is color temperature. We can talk about that later, but this color temperature blue light. And then we have this um, more amber 3000 K. And we predicted that, you know, if these uh, spectral sensitivities of these deep brain photoreceptors really matter, then we should have an effect by this blue light because it's really overlapping these compared to this amber one, which is just gonna be down here mildly affecting them. There's gonna be a lot different behavior and physiology in birds that are exposed to blue light. So we ran a study where we took zebra finches and put them under uh, light at night. Everything was the same during the day. And we also, I have to say, we use very dim light. We use the same values of light that would be in a suburban area at night due to the satellite data that I showed earlier. And we had the 3000K, we had a 5000K, and we also had a control light, which we had light bulbs there, but there was no light. Uh, we, again, 
predicted that the blue light would cause more problems for the birds. And in fact, this is the setup. So birds are under these different lights, the three treatments. And what we find first is, well, I should say what we first is we recorded the actual activity of these zebra finch. There's a nice little setup where you have a perch and it's connected uh, to a piece of paper or it's digital. And as the bird moves, it makes a little tick. So you can see when the bird is moving on the perch because it just the bird just weighs it down. So we can compare this from day to night to see when the bird is actually moving. So this is the first thing we did. We looked at activity across the, the trials. Um, and here is the control birds. So as you can see, this is at night. There was very, very little activity of them at night. This line here is day four. I'm sorry that the axis isn't showing up. It's weird. That's odd. So this uh, right here is day five, and then it's day about day 30 over here. Um, and this is day four. This is when, so the first four days, the birds were just put into the chamber without any treatment light at night. They were just there to just acclimate. And then we started to shine the lights on. And you can see that they're basically the same in the beginning. And then you turn the light on. Then we start to have more activity with the ones that are under um, 0.3 bucks of this amber light. Then the blue light comes in, that group. Look at how much. So they're way more active. And what's interesting, though, is that they then start to die down and they get back to basically just having light with the yellow. Um, they're not as active as they were before. So they somewhat acclimate, but there's a huge effect at first uh, based on that blue light. All right, and then we looked at the stress. And the way you measure stress in birds is you look at the court levels. Um, and we can just measure this in the blood. And what we found is that the birds that were under blue light had way higher court levels um, during the experiment than before. Whereas the other ones had lower court. And this is to be expected. If there's no effect of your treatment, your court level should go down because the birds are caught, they're put in a cage and you measure court. And so they're very stressed. And then they, they get used to the place and you measure them again, their court's gone down a little bit. So the fact that we've caught all these birds, throw them in a cage, we measure their court, and then we give them blue lights and we come back and measure and their court's even way higher. Just talks about how incredibly stressed these birds are. Okay, so to regroup really quick, well, I've got a couple more minutes. Um, yes, pollution. So light pollution, uh, it's global, it's all over the place. It's in a lot of very sensitive habitats. And we know that a lot of animals are affected by these just low levels of light. So global protected areas, key biodiversity areas are still having um, light pollution coming in and possibly uh, affecting or altering the behavior and physiology of so many of these organisms that the whole point of these conservation areas is to protect them. So reception and detection of light pollution uh, comes down to the cones and the photoreceptors that an organism has. Birds have much better color vision and see a much colorful and artificial nightscape than us. We can't just use our own vision to say whether birds will be affected. They also have non-visual photoreceptors that are in their brain that detect the light. So because their skull is so uh, diaphanous, light comes in and it leads to uh, physiological and behavioral changes as we just saw in the zebra finches. All right. So lastly, really quickly, I wanna talk about a quick predation study uh, so I don't know if you guys have ever seen a video like this. You've definitely seen insects flying around a light at night. You see that here. Then you have a bat that comes in and predates on these moths flying around this low pressure sodium light. So the next question, of course, that you, you can see where I'm going with is how would different colors of these light sources affect predation on these moths? So birds are actually changing when they forage uh, and when they're active due to artificial light. There are some fantastic studies earlier this decade, or I guess now last decade, about five years ago, uh, showing that urban birds, um, birds in urban parks, they are foraging way earlier in the morning and way later at night. So their twilight is being expanded. If they used to forage at like 5 a.m., they're now foraging at like 4 a.m. So they're foraging in the dark because they're perceiving it as twilight due to all the anthropogenic light. So I wanna know 
uh, if these different light sources are actually affecting the ability of birds to detect um, a prey item such as a moth. So what we did is we, we used two different uh, colors of light. We used uh, LEDs and high pressure sodium, which now you guys are experts with the spectra down below. Uh, and we were putting moss out there to see would birds and bats have better uh, detectability and thus more predation on moths under LEDs compared to high pressure sodiums. Um, we use the army cutworm moth, which probably you guys are not that familiar uh, with. However, if you've seen um, planet Earth, you might remember this clip here of a grizzly bear going up high up into the Rocky Mountains, flipping over rocks and eating moths. And that's these moths. So these moths, they um, emerge from the, the plains of North America and then they migrate towards the Rockies where they reproduce high up at like 13, 14,000 feet. Bears climb up these very steep scree slopes to eat these moths because these moths are the fattest animal known to science. These moths are 73% body fat. Uh, for comparison, the fattest whales are around 41%. So even though each one of these moths is just about two calories, um, they really are very, very nutritious and result in big, trophic cascades, big food chain cascades. Um, they're very, very, very important for feeding a lot of the organisms in the Rockies, including grizzly bears. Again, there's nothing up there. This is just rocky slopes and these grizzly bears are going up there to eat these moths. Because they migrate from the plains, they also uh, are all over the lights during these migrations. This is um, taken in Fort Collins in June where you have all these lights flying around. Sorry, you have all these moths flying around these lights. All right. So using a, a team of incredible undergrads, we did this predation experiment where we went out, caught some moths. We measured the reflectance of the wings and we made paper wings so that we could tie them to different streetlight poles. Using the, um, or I should say, teaming up with Fort Collins Utilities, we found out where all the different lights are, which ones are LEDs, which ones are high pressure sodium, the different wattages. And we were able to put these throughout neighborhoods in Fort Collins. Uh, and then we could check them at night. Well, and during the day too, we, we wanted to make sure these were attacked only at night. So we checked them right before uh, night set and then right after. So sunrise, sunset basically. Although it was a little bit after and a little bit before, so we didn't have just twilight. Uh, and you can see here, there's a beak mark. So this is where a bird actually came and nabbed this, this moth. These methods have been used for a very long time in evolutionary studies to see what kind of traits uh, are attacked. And so we're using them here to see what kind of light leads to um, predation. And so this is what we predicted. We predicted that the LEDs, because it's blue and white light, that a moth under this is gonna be much easier to be seen. As we talked about earlier, due to the color contrast, right, of the cones. Um, and then high pressure sodium, although it's mostly gonna be red shifted, it's not going to be as conspicuous, but it's gonna be brighter. So a bird um, or a bat should still be able to see it better than a control moth, which is not gonna be under any direct light, but instead just on a pole, such as like a volleyball pole or a street uh, pole that doesn't have any uh, light. So like a stop sign, for instance. So we predicted high predation on LED, medium predation on high pressure sodium, and low on ambient or control. And these are the assumed uh, light environments of those. However, what we found after three days of checking these is that the highest attack rates were actually on the ambient controls. And then the next was LEDs. There was no significant difference between the LED and the ambient control. There was a significant difference with high pressure sodium. If you're a moth, you wanna be under high pressure sodium. Turns out you have a much lower chance of being attacked. And so that, was confusing. Why would moths under dark ambient controls have the highest attack rates? It should be very difficult to be seen. But it turns out they're not under the starlight condition, which is the spectrum that you see here, but instead they're under just this urban sky glow light that looks like this. So it's a little bit dimmer than what you have with the direct LED illuminating that moth. There's still a lot of light because it's an urban environment and it's still pretty broadband. You have a lot of blue, and you have a lot of uh, oh, 
Uh, so with that being said, um, we did some quick visual models to see what the contrast of these moths uh, against the background would be under these different light sources. So we found that the JNDs of an LED were two. So again, this is like, it'd be hard to see, but, but birds would be able to detect them against the background. High pressure sodium was right around one, meaning it'd be very difficult for a bird to perceive the moth under that light environment. And surprisingly, the ambience actually had the highest JNDs with a three, meaning that it would actually be the easiest for a bird to perceive a moth under those light conditions. So what we actually found is that urban light environments um, make it easier for birds to be uh, perceiving their prey against natural urban backgrounds. All right, and this matters because there's starlight, which again is 50% of, of uh, annual nighttime. And then we have urban ambient lighting, which looks nothing like starlight. And remember that birds and bats and all these animals have evolved to pay attention to these natural light levels and it's all being disrupted. What is very interesting is that this urban ambient lighting actually is pretty aligned with twilight, which again is why we have so many birds that are singing at two in the morning uh, because they're being tricked. They think it's twilight or they're foraging at two in the morning, three in the morning. I and mean, we had so many avian attacks uh, on clay moths uh, at like two and three in the morning. This is weird. It shouldn't be happening. And it, has, it happens to be due to this uh, light pollution. Okay, so with that, uh, I just wanna conclude really quick with, so blue and ambient urban light have a greater predation on moths than the warmer high pressure sodium lights. And that has to do with the contrast. Lastly, three little things that we can do to reduce light pollution. Well, we can reduce it spatially. We can put on um, detectors and timers to limit it temporally and then spectrally, which I believe someone asked a question right before we even started talking um, about what colors are the best. All right, with that, um, I thank you for your time. And I just wanna remind all of us that we should check our houses to see what lights we have on that we're not using, especially outside ones. Do you have a security light that's shining in a small area? Oh, and somehow this is timed. We're done, we're gonna stop it here. And so I'll stop sharing. And I will now take any questions. So let's see, I'm looking over in the chat. Yeah, I was gonna say maybe chat might be the best way to, to do this, Brett, if you wanna scroll through. I think there were some questions early on. You may have addressed those, but if anybody has any questions, maybe you can just type them into the chat. Perfect, yeah, so um, <clears throat> there was a direct question. So is cort cortisone, uh, for all intents and purposes, yes, uh, it is. It's actually corticosteroid, corticosterone in birds. But yeah, it's, it's cortisone, which is a classic stress hormone. So your body, when it's you know under a stressful situation, it secretes more cort or cortisone or cort corticoroids or whatever they are in birds. I'm an insect person. Um, let's see. And then there was, so from Pete, uh, any ideas about moth densities around sodium LED in suburban lighting? Uh, yeah, so we know a lot about this. We know that most moths are attracted to, to all these lights, especially uh, LEDs. So the, the, the more blue a light is, uh, the more attracted most insects are, especially moths. They're still attracted to high pressure sodium. <clears throat> They're not hardly attracted at all to uh, low pressure sodium, which don't really exist anymore. But if you have like a, an amber or a 2800 K light that's very reddish, most moths can't see that. Their spectral sensitivity only goes to about like 560. So they're not able to perceive those lights. So they're, they're not going to see them. They're not going to fly to them. But anything with like a that's very bright white, like a mercury vapor, they're they're very attracted to them. So yes, you know, if you go to a, a, a football game or a baseball game and you look up, usually you'll see a lot of insects flying around. You'll see a lot of bats. Bats have learned, and there's several good studies showing that bats will actually go to light and just hang around and wait for insects to come. 
Uh, let's see. Yeah, so Ellen has a great question here. Um, oh, I'm gonna get to Chris's first. So Chris, uh, are street light shields directing light downward effectively? Yes and no, it just depends on whether they're actually installed correctly. So many times there are uh, what are called full cutoff um, filters on street lights. And it makes it so basically you can't see the bulb and the lights also supposed to go down correctly. However, a lot of them aren't put on correctly. So they're like facing the wrong way. So then there's still light that's going up. But yeah, if you have a full cutoff filter, that's fantastic. That puts all the light down where it needs to be. And now what you have to worry about is the actual light that's being reflected off of the, um, the surface, like the asphalt or whatever. If that was the problem we were dealing with, this would be a lot easier. So, I mean, if we can first get all the lights to just be, have full cutoff filters, especially security lights, which will still be just as effective, um, if they have cutoff filters, that would be a, a huge step in the right direction. All right, uh, light pollution affect bird migration cues. Yeah, so there's a lot of research on this. I actually had a couple slides I pulled out. I don't study this directly. Um, there's a very interesting study by Van Dorn in 2017 that focused on the memorial lights in uh, New York City. So these were turned on by, um, for 9-11 um, and they're big blue floodlights and they're only on for one day. But over the seven years of having them on just for one day is estimated that about 1.1 million birds died because they, a lot of migrating birds, they get distracted by these lights. They fly over to them and they just, they fly in the light. They're so confused until they just exhaust themselves and fall to the ground and they die or they hit a building. Uh, we know that this is also the case here up the Mississippi corridor, right? Which is a big migra migratory path. I don't have to tell you guys, you guys all know this. Um, but yeah, the lights here attract them toward these tall buildings, they hit the glass or they just get exhausted or predators will also nab them. Uh, let's see, there's a lot of questions now. Are interior lights that shine outside bad? In other words, do we need to pull shades at night? <sighs> Again, if this is what we were really worried about, um, there would be a lot less mortality and effects if it was all just light going out. Uh, and, it, you know, at the end of the day, too, I, yeah, you, I mean, you can sleep better at night knowing if you, you pull your shades at night, there's not any light going out into your backyard. It will help with the natural insects, uh, the natural insect fauna, which will help with your natural uh, avian predators uh, and your reptiles, all that. Sure. I'm not going to start a campaign right now that's focused on people you know, closing their, their shades at night. I th what we do need to do is so many buildings, these big corporations have beautiful glass buildings, which of course are bad for birds during the day, but they also have lights on at night that are so bright and they're going through these, these huge windows uh, and tons of birds are crashing into them. The insects is terrible. So yes, big corporations with big buildings, they should have automatic shades. They have the money to do this. They have automatic shades that close. There's no reason then we need to see these giant uh, lit up buildings. So yes, shades are important at a residential level. Like maybe if you lived out in the forest in a very sensitive habitat, yeah, you should have shades. But um, in a neighborhood, it's not, that's not the big deal currently. Um, are solar lights in the landscaping bad? Well, I don't think it has anything to do whether they're solar or not. I mean, that's better than, you know, pulling electricity, obviously a lower carbon footprint. It all comes down to, again, like what spectrum are you using? Are you using a really bright blue or is it more of an amber? Uh, and where, where are they shining? Do they have a full cutoff? Are they only about three feet high? So they're just illuminating a path that you need to walk on. Those are fantastic. I mean, that's, that's what light's for. And that, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not gonna, if again, all the lighting was three feet off the ground in a nice amber light, illuminating paths, <laughs> we would, I wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't be studying this. I'd be studying something way different. Um, let's see, any thoughts about the Starlink satellites, which are basically fake stars? David, I don't know exactly what you're asking about. I mean, I'm gonna go on a hunt here. Uh, I don't actually know what the Starlink satellites, if they're, I don't think they're collecting any data. Uh, I assume they're for like telecommunications. Uh, so fake stars. We do know that a lot of insects actually use celestial cues and, and sort of some um, vertebrates for migrating and for navigating at night. 
And uh, though, you know, if we had enough of these fake stars, it could actually be very distracting and very misleading for a lot of these nocturnal organisms that do use uh, celestial cues to, to navigate and orient in their environment. All right, Tim, any thoughts on any relationships between artificial light pollution and insect or bird decline reports? Yes, in fact, uh, I just had a paper out last year. Um, if you guys go to my website, which is just brettseymour.com, there's all my papers are there so you can read more about this, but there's one on uh, light pollution leading to the insect um, apocalypse, which is a buzz term in science. Which is just, we know that tons of insects are declining. I'd be happy to come back another time and give a talk about light pollution and insects or just insects in general and light. Uh, but yes, absolutely. We know that there's direct evidence that light pollution is leading to declines in insects. There's also very good evidence that's leading to declines in migratory birds. I'm not sure that the link is as strong as it is with insects, but it's, it's there. there. There is direct evidence, yes. Um, so Mary, so how do we convince the general public that we don't have to illuminate everything? Education, right? And this is something when we just have to be patient, we just have to educate. Uh, we have to rely on entities like the Audubon, like uh, natural historian societies, like the International Dark Sky Association. And we just have to be, as we've learned so much over the last several years, right? We have to just be patient and inclusive and and patient, <laughs> just very patient and educate and just talk about how science is showing all these things. Um, and we just have to educate and, and people will get it. You know, it's easier actually with, um, hopefully I don't offend anyone here, but with the older generation, it's a lot easier to talk about light pollution because so many of the older generation remember uh, fireflies and they enjoy fireflies, right? They're an incredible thing. And they say, yeah, I used to see so many fireflies and don't see them anymore. Well, that's light pollution, right? The fireflies are gone because of light pollution. <laughs> With the younger generation, they don't, they never saw fireflies. They don't care. Uh, so that's a little bit harder. And the younger generation is just so, you know, so screen obsessed um, and so light obsessed and it's much more urban. So dark is scary. So again, it's just education. It's getting people out into natural environments. It's trying to show people that dark's not scary. Um, but yeah, so probably like, you know, most problems, education. Is the solution. Hey, Brett, I want to visit Dennis, but I don't want to be sensitive to your time. Do you want to take maybe just two more questions? Yeah, sure. Um, I think we're getting down to the bottom. So William and Margaret, are there studies of the difference in Skygo contribution between suburban residential and urban high rise? No, that's really hard to do because the, the measurements of sky glow are at such a large spatial scale. Uh, the satellite detects them at you know 700 square meters, which is blocks. Um, and it's tough to tease out specifically where the light's scattering from if you've got, you know, an urban center and then all the suburbia right around it. It's, it's, it's difficult to say. So I don't think there's any study that's looked at that specifically. You could picture a way of doing it where you compare different cities and the, the relative contribution of, of um, high rises to suburban area. I don't think that's been done. They're, they're both doing it. And a lot of it's coming from like street lights and industrial lighting. Um, let's see. So Dan, I've heard of reports of seeing kites feeding at night at Bush Stadium. Yeah, of course, I, I believe that. Uh, James, what can we maybe nationally do, actually do? What kind of societal institutional changes need to happen to reduce or at least to slow this as we continue to urban sprawl across the continent? Well, so Europe has done a lot. So Europe has out, uh, lawed a lot of different light sources. They've also really worked with conservation entities like the International Dark Sky Association. Um, there's a lot that can be done. I mean, if we have the infrastructure and we put the money into it, we can have street lights, right, that detect when cars are coming and turn on. We also, you know, cars have, uh, we don't need as many street lights as we have. We, again, through education, we can have parks that don't have these bright lights, they're just not needed. Um, working with engineers, we could develop better lighting uh, that would maintain human enjoyment at night. So there's, there's a lot that can be done. I would point you to IDA or come join us and with, we talk about these things, uh, but there's, there's a lot. We're definitely not doing hardly enough, uh, if anything. 
there's a lot that can there's a lot that can be done. Um, can anyone talk to landscapers, lightning bugs? Yeah, um, yes, we can we can talk to uh, to landscapers. And there's also, of course, the pesticide issue. And yeah, so then Don, last question here: Can you talk about streetlights in relation to light pollution? Um, so I forget the stat that I told Don once. But about the amount, it's billions, it's billions of dollars uh, a year that are put into streetlights that are not actually illuminating anything, right? It's just lighting up the side of the street. It's billions of dollars. And so there's so much that we could do with, with street lighting alone across the country that would greatly reduce the costs of uh, energy, the use of energy, and artificial light. Um, of course, you know, there's billions of roads roads across the United States and a lot of them have street lights. So street lights along with high rises and stuff, street lights are the easiest thing to focus because they're, they're government owned. It's tough to talk to big corporations uh, without putting regulation on them. But street lights, that's our government, right? We can write to our, uh, our policy makers and have them do this and save our money, save our, our tax paying dollars. Um, but yeah, so I, uh, yeah, I appreciate the time to come talk to you. Sorry if my talk was a little bit long. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll stop talking now. Right, thanks so much. I mean, this is, I think, really informative and really demonstrates the complexity of the world that we live in. So I wanna thank you very much for spending some time with us.